Smarta, a strong universal network, a global initiative to support climate resilience and emergency response through climate friendly travel. Professor Littman was formerly executive director of International Air Transport Association, first president of World Travel and Tourism Council, and assistant secretary general of United Nations World Tourism Organization. Sir has played a key role in emergence of tourism. He has served on public and private sector boards in many countries. He is a member of EU commissions on airline liberalization and on tourism employment, President of International Coalition, Coalition of Tourism Partners. Professor Jeffrey Lipman is also a very creative disruptive disruption architect and is also the director of Green Earth or Travel. Now I would like to request sir to please proceed with your session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, and it's a real pleasure to be with you. Um, we have agreed today that the subject of my lecture would be the making of 2020 of a climate-friendly travel paradigm. Um, this idea that 2020 would become the year of climate-friendly travel was a concept that we thought up simply as a tagline at the end of 2019 in order to um, <laughs> in order to have a message that, that resonated. Little did we know, and they say you should be careful of what you wish for, because little did we know that 2020, not for the reasons that we envisage, but because of the COVID-19 virus, would be actually become the year when travel and tourism reduced its carbon footprint dramatically in some markets up to 90 percent and worldwide 50 percent and um <laughs> so the reality is and everything is focused on the pandemic every country every cabinet is a human activity is rightly focused on ensuring that the health dimensions of this pandemic are paramount. And sadly, tourism is um, right at the epicenter of the pandemic because the pandemic is, the, the virus is very infectious perhaps one of its most significant characteristics is the ease with which it passes from person to person. And the reality is it loves travel because travel is the way that people meet other people and, and carry the virus between countries. So obviously for the past six months, the entire world of travel and tourism has come to a halt. And I know for everybody listening to me today, it's hard to take mind off COVID-19, hard to take your mind, when does life get back to normal again? Probably it's hard to think other than nothing could be worse. And the, the slide that I'm showing now is actually a cartoon from The Economist, which basically says, if you think COVID-19 has been bad, whether from the viewpoint, personal viewpoint, a societal viewpoint, or a somewhat narrower travel and tourism viewpoint, it's actually being compared to what the impact of climate change is going to be as it as it intensifies in the coming years. And that will be the theme of, of my comments today. It's absolutely right that the entire world is focused on responding to the climate, to, to the COVID crisis. But it's also 
fundamentally important that we do not lose sight of the ongoing climate crisis. Because whereas the COVID crisis is incredibly damaging to human life and also incredibly damaging to, to the economy and to our sector, the reality of the matter is the climate crisis will be COVID-19 on steroids. And the reason why I say that is because the science was that the climate crisis is existential. Existential, I repeat that word because existential means that our grandchildren will freeze or fry. You can see from this chart, the area indicates progressing now in terms of our, our global warming and carbon pool. And using the current patterns, we will be caught early on in the middle of this, that our kids are caught even more so 2020 and our grandkids will have intense dramatic warming which will affect every facet of their lives as I've said here part of the challenge of this is the scientists can tell us that the atmosphere is warming and the consequences of that is incredibly adverse weather patterns, unpredictable, intense weather patterns of kinds that we have seen before. And I would say intensifying because the impact of the, of the heat inside this blanket that we've created around our planet is that it will dramatically affect and make more extreme our weather pattern. And you can see from this slide here, already we are seeing the hottest weather that we've ever had. We're seeing incredible floods in some world, hurricanes, and we're seeing the ice sheets melt at levels at which they haven't melted before. And whilst this is not as universally dramatic as COVID-19, if you happen to be in a place where it's happening, it's very, very dramatic. So if you were in the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, when you had an intensive hurricane last year, you see the entire society, the social framework is wiped out. And this is part of the challenge that we have to face as we move. Travel tourism is again the important element of this change. Why? because directly and indirectly we're driving 10% of the global economy. And in those countries which have become very dependent on tourism, small island states, landlocked states who, who have had difficulty in trading goods in the same way as they've been able to trade tourism services, it can be 30, 40, 50% of the economy. And when disaster strikes, as you can see from these pictures, from the forest fires that we've had in Australia last year, from the uh, tundra melting in Siberia, incredible heat, and the melting of the ice caps, and the melting of the ice caps, raising global sea levels, and travel and tourism over the years has been putting 
its its product, its plant on the seashore in many, 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 many places. And we are caught in a terrible situation where all the predictability in our weather patterns on which tourism has been based is suddenly changing. It's becoming unpredictable. And then perhaps one of the most was in the yellow square here. This is driving people out of their land a better living condition elsewhere. Uh, you see this in the decade between 2008 and 2018, there were 20 million climate refugees around the world. And in any projection going forward, these figures are expected to grow dramatically. And that's why climate change is existential. And that's why travel and tourism is involved in it. Somewhere around 5% of global CO2. 5% may not seem like so much, but it's significant. In addition, because one of our most fundamental elements, which is aviation, has got no alternative at this moment, we believe, and scientists tell us, that the 5% could increase to as much as 20% by 2050. And remember that date of 2050, because that's the date that the international community tagged as the date when which we have to have a solution for this problem. Otherwise, the world will be in real. And, and the aviation carbon impact with no alternative fuel at this moment is on base projections is pushing that 5% up in the area of 15 to 20%. And of course, that means that our sector will be much more visible and come under increasing attack to change the way that it operates. This leads me to talk a little bit about Sun X Malta and the plans that we have to help the sector, the entire sector, companies and, com and communities around the world make the necessary adaptation so that they will be able to play a leading part in responding to the climate crisis which is upon us. And this is the logo of Sunex Malta. It's a collaboration between an NGO created by Maurice Strong. I'll talk about Maurice Strong in a second, together with myself. And its purpose was to was to be a catalyst for the travel and tourism sector to respond to the climate crisis and to be a conduit for our sector into the broader mainstream activity where governments are making the policy shift which will be necessary to deal with this crisis. And as you can see in the, in the logo which we created, it's not a particularly um, sexy logo, but it, it, it consists of the, the brand of SunX, Strong Universal Network, and, and here is, is, a, is a picture of Morris Strong, who died in 2015. Goal. A small island but one which has been very active 
in putting the challenge of climate change on the agenda of the international community. And indeed, it was MOLA which put climate change on the agenda of the General Assembly of the United Nations in, in um, 1987, when it first went onto the agenda. So we are very pleased to, to have the support of the Minister of Tourism and Consumer Protection in Malta um, and, and the Malta Tourism Authority. And we operate um, out of Malta, which is an EU member state. We are actively engaged in supporting the EU Green Deal, which is the policy structure that the EU has developed for dealing with climate changes and the other important challenges to, that we have going forward. And there you also see the symbol of the Sustainable Development Goals, because we believe are another important component of the adaptation which is needed. And last but not least, a plan for our kids, because this is a, a challenge and, and a solutions framework which will only be realized by the next generation and the generation after that. It's our, it's our task to set the plan in motion. Is the progression of, of some 75 years that the world has been focused on the environmental challenges to, to our planet, and particularly also to the climate um, challenges. And this institutional framework that our world has put together over time and projecting through to 2050 to respond to the climate crisis and to ensure that we develop sustainably. And so much of this framework was put in place by Morris Strong, my friend and mentor, and, and um, whose vision Sun X is trying to, to keep alive and to, and to help link with the travel and tourism sector Morris believed that the travel and tourism sector had a special role in responding to these issues because we are so widespread, because we are so significant in terms of our economic and societal contribution, and because we communicate with so many people. If you look at this chart, you can see that everything really started in 1972 when the Club of Rome produced its, its famous treatise about the limits to growth. And the United Nations, which is really the custodian of the global response system, held its first environmental summit in Stockholm. That summit was organized by Maurice Strong. And even then, in 1972, Maurice Strong was calling climate change an existential crisis. And building institutions and setting in place plans and programs to help respond to it. And you can see, I haven't listed everything which, which was created. UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme, came out of the 1972 Stockholm Summit. Maurice Strong was the first executive director. The Brunswick Commission, Maurice was a member of that, which defined sustainable development as operating in a way which uses the resources on this planet without jeopardizing their use by our children. That was 1987. And in 1992, there was the massive Rio Earth Summit, and the Rio Earth Summit, largest gathering of heads of state. Maurice Strong was Secretary General of that event. 
And I was there. It was um, one of the first major events that I attended when I was president of the World Travel and Tourism Council. And it was an incredible event with over 120 heads of state, presidents, kings, queens, and the decision framework, Agenda 21, an agenda for the 21st century, which was designed to make life on the planet sustainable. And then if you follow this chart, you see that in 2000, the United Nations decided to develop the Millennium Development Goals. This was part of the campaign against poverty, and the MDGs were designed to lift countries and peoples out of poverty. And there were 10 Millennium Development Goals. They had a, a target to 2010. And then in 2012, there was another conference called Rio Plus 20. And out of Rio Plus 20 came the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals were launched in 2015. And they were different from the Millennium Development Goals because whereas the MDGs were focused on the world's poorest nations and, and fighting against poverty, the SDGs were identified as being an agenda for every nation and every issue on the planetary agenda. There are 17 sustainable development goals, 169 targets, and 200 plus indicators. And countries are creating plans to achieve those targets and indicators by 2030. And the is geared up to, to um, review and um, critique the development patterns of nations as they advance these goals going forward. In that same year, in 2015, which was really a landmark year for the planet, there was also another event in Addis Ababa dealing with creating finance for all of this activity. But most importantly, and particularly importantly for the issue of today, the heads of state of all the world's countries came together in Paris and agreed the Paris Climate Accord. And there they set a framework to keep the temperatures, temperature of the planet contained at no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. So they set a planetary target and they said we should aim for two degrees, but ideally we should be pitching for 1.5 degrees. And they had masses of scientific material, huge reports showing the consequences of not keeping our temperatures to that level. And and on this chart, you can see the climate targets of 2050 and SDG 13, which is the climate action target. So this framework is what is driving our society. Everybody listening to this, this particular, excuse me, this particular presentation, your country has filed a carbon reduction proposal with the United Nations Climate Agency, it's called the UCCC, it's the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, it's located in Bonn in Germany, and every country has filed a plan for how it will reduce its carbon between now and 2050 so that collectively we keep a lid on global temperatures. And the reality is, inside the national plans, inside the national plans, 
all companies, all communities are giving up to the need to have their own plans because in the end, the country plan is only an aggregate of the activities going on inside the country. And so we have this goal for 2050 and on the journey, we have the 2030 SDG targets. So it's that background that I turn to the specific place of the travel and tourism sector in this development, in this evolution to 2050. And you will recall that I said we're a significant sector. It's been evident from what's happened in COVID-19 that so much of the world economy is tied in to people traveling, whether it's for business, for leisure, for visiting friends and relatives. That ecosystem is one of the most critical ecosystems in the future of humanity. At this moment, our analysis shows that our sector is not pulling its weight in terms of responding to the Paris Agreement and the climate crisis. And so we have developed a conceptual framework called Climate Friendly Travel, which is designed to help the community move a leadership position and today I'm going to try and spend the rest of this time explaining to you what that conceptual framework is and how we believe it can work looking forward into this 20 30 year time and it's very difficult to do that but it's absolutely necessary that we have to be thinking in these decade long shifts and putting in place the mechanisms to do them now, not only because that makes common sense, but because the rest of the society is doing that. Travel and tourism is one sector, one industry, one lifestyle activity. But all the other activities are in their own framework moving in this direction. We have to become a low carbon activity from a high carbon activity. That means all our transport, all our, all our hospitality, accommodation, all the ancillary activities, restaurants, taxis, things that people do when they're traveling, they all have to become low carbon if we are to reach our target requirements. The they have to be linked to the SDGs because whilst we are moving our carbon needle, we also have to move all of the other elements of society. And it's very important to understand here, we say they have to be SDG linked. Different companies, different communities, will see their activity in relation to different ones of the, of the sustainable development goals. If you happen to be in a, in a side location in India, you will have very different priorities and some the same as a mountain region in India. And incumbent on every community and every company to find which of these goals, which of these targets, which of these indicators are the most relevant for you and to develop programs which allow you to meet the targets that the United Nations framework is moving towards for 2030. For some people, it will be life underwater. For other people, it will be life on land. For other people, it will be poverty elimination. There are 17 of these goals, but for everybody, goal number 13, climate action, is critical. And the of this act
is we have to align our total carbon and greenhouse gas outputs to the levels that are required in Paris under the Paris Agreement. And we have to do this not in relation to the attempted two degrees increase in global temperatures, but we have to be targeted on 1.5 degrees because we're already out of our tolerance levels. The latest report from the body of scientists in the IPCC, which is the, the scientific community which is tracking climate developments, says that at the current time, we're heading for three degrees. At three degrees in 2050, our world will be devastated. So we have to start to make that change now. And what I'm going to now show you is what we call our four-step action plan for climate-friendly travel. <clears throat> and it's, you know, this is not a simple issue. Transformation over a 20, 30 year time frame of every activity on the planet, and in our case, of all of the complex activities related to travel and tourism, is going to be a challenge, a huge challenge. But we believe that if we follow a common template, which is applied to companies and individual countries and individual customers according to their unique circumstance, we should collectively over time be able to get onto the same pathway. It won't happen immediately. It will take several years. We have to have a vision and we have to have mechanisms to allow us to achieve that vision. And this is one that we have developed. Step is simply to embrace the concept of climate friendly travel. That it learn the SDG linked and that it be Paris 1.5 framework. This is a, a beginning point for everybody. It's necessary to create a plan to 2050, which is what the rest of society are doing in the UN Climate Agency, but travel and tourism has been slow to do, and to register that plan. In the next two months, we will launch a global registry from Senex Malta, and it will be, we have been holding discussions with the UN Climate Agency. It's built to be entirely compatible with the registry that the UN itself has built, and we will become the gateway for travel and tourism entities around the world, including all companies and all communities in India to register and to develop and to change and evolve climate neutral 2050 plans. And, and this is absolutely the way that the rest of society is moving and it's the way that we will have to move. The first step is to find champions inside companies and communities and to train them. We have created this year a first ever diploma in, in climate friendly travel. And it's designed to train young, smart people. I call them the birds of this world. It's designed to train them to be able to help the company and the community to make the transformation. And it's a 12 month online course. People can take it whilst they're still doing their work. And at the end, receive a diploma. 
to marshal groups of 50 what we call strong climate champions inside the country and to help in the transformation process. If this program proceeds over 10 years to 2030, at that time, we will have 100,000 bright young climate champions who are working actively to help companies and communities make the transformation. Inside, and I want to go back, to go back through these steps because they're critically important. Step one, is to commit to climate-friendly travel and to target relevant SDG actions and to make a pledge that you're going to be part of the Paris 1.5 world. My slides seem to have been halting here. Step to register this, we may have to do this without slides. This is the challenge of technology. Step two is to register this and to create a, a climate neutral plan, which will be filed on the registry that will open in September. And that plan will be reviewed and changed by the people who file it every year. And we'll have two years inside the registry developing the plan before they have to formally deliver it. In the third, from a student, we're going to build a system in their own organization, communities will begin to build a system of internal training who will help to keep this plan on track. And in step four, these young people will go out and just in the same way that Greta Thunberg has marshaled climate activists, they also be able to marshal equally engaged young people using social media. And they will do this, they will do this through their social media network and through their other mechanisms that they're using for this incredible communications framework, which is emerging and which is becoming the, the norm, just like this webinar is becoming the norm. And we believe that as the technology improves and we put in place in every country, by 2030, there'll be at least 500 of these climate champions in every country. Our plan is to have 100,000 by 2030 using incredibly advanced technology. They will become a core for helping our sector make its transformation. We will produce tools, which then these tools include the registry, the diploma, a consumer app, which have announced last week, which will be available for travelers so that they can see which companies are following a climate friendly travel pattern, which companies are doing so, so that we'll bring the power of the market into play and the market will help the companies along with regulation, which will emerge to make the transformation which is necessary. We will have all of these tools in place by the end of the year, and we will be working with partners. We call them SDG 17 partners because the Sustainable Development Goals has a partnership component. It's goal number 17. 
and we will be linking working in a win-win fashion with partners who share this vision and who want to work with us to spread it around the world. And my last slide, I think at a stage where we should be having the questions and answers soon. My, my last slide basically has a group of kids on it with the message, act now. We need to act now if we want to resolve the problems that are coming to us so clearly that we saw in the, in the slides at the beginning of this presentation. If we act now, it will cost less, it will be less painful, there will be more new, green, clean job opportunities, and we will create the kind of world that we would want our kids and our grandkids to grow up in. So that's a short review of the climate intersect with travel and tourism, and the actions that we're taking at Sunex Malta in order to try to help the industry, to help companies, to help communities to move to a, a climate resilient, climate responsive framework. There's no doubt in my mind that at the end of the day, individual companies and individual communities will have to find their own path. But as I leave you with this, by 2050, we all have to be in the same place. And to get to 2050, this is like an oil tank. You have to turn it miles away from the place you want to go to in order to reach it. And in that tanker, on, on, on a very precarious path to possibly a much cleaner and greener future. But to do that, we have to understand the issues, we have to understand the challenges, we have to see the opportunities because there are many job opportunities here, economic opportunities, um, engineering opportunities, infrastructure opportunities, but to seize them, we have to have a shared vision and we have to move together. So thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to take them now. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, am I audible to you? Yes, I can hear you. Right, sir. Uh, sir, first of now all, I can, now uh, I can see you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much for this very engaging, informative, as well as an eye opening presentation. The way you have described how climate change it enjoys an intersection with the travel and tourism industry, as well as the industry being at the epicenter of climate change, is really commendable. Now, sir, we have a few questions from the end of our students which I will be conveying to you. So the first question is, someone is asking, could you please tell us more about the Sanex Malta Climate Friendly Travel Diploma? Yes. yes. Um, this is a world first. It's based on a program that I actually gave for two years running in Slovenia um, two or three years ago. It's a diploma which looks at the roots of the climate issue, the impact of the climate issue on society and where travel and tourism fits into this. It shows how travel and tourism policymakers and practitioners are beginning to adapt to the climate change and it shows how where the this is. It's, uh, it's 
detailed, but it's very, very broad in its scope. And what, where I think it is particularly interesting, I've been very fortunate over the years. I've run three big international organizations. I've made incredibly good friendships over the years. And I've been able to provide 25 of the world's leading, I think, thought leaders in this intersect between climate change and travel and tourism, um, Professor Harold Warren, who, who developed the pro-poor tourism and responsible tourism. Um, Professor Susanna Beckham, who is one of the lead the thought leaders from Griffith University in Australia. Um, and and a whole Felix Dodds, who, who was the um, secretary of the UN Stakeholders Forum, and has written three books on the Sustainable Development Goals. And if these professors will be giving a half-hour lecture on of this whole climate change framework, and including what are the necessary steps to respond to it. We have practitioners doing these lectures, and each 30-minute lecture will be followed by a question and answer session. So other than that, it's a, it's a diploma, it's deliberately at the diploma level. It's, it could range from, from school leavers to graduates to people who've been working in companies and who have an appetite for this issue. And it's, um, you know, it, the course is, I believe, relatively inexpensive as, as courses go. I think if you're to, to join it from India, it's 3,500 euros for the full 12 month course, at the end of which you get a diploma. And it's a diploma which is given by the Institute of Tourism Studies in Malta, who are, who are our partner in this, and, and they're a recognized institution. And by the way, they're great to work with. They're terrific people, very easygoing, friendly, good technology to use. And, and we're very excited about it. So we'd love to have some students from India. We may well, we're trying to find some scholarships. So, you know, please, at the end of this slide presentation, I did have our, our web address. I can't seem to get there, but um, it's my comment. Yes, sir. Yeah, right, sir. Uh, so there is a second question. Um, I mean, you have already mentioned that uh, climate crisis is going to intensify in the upcoming years. We all know that it is existential, as has been told by researchers earlier. But then at the same time, when we have activists like that of Greta Thunberg, uh, but at the same time, there are a lot many misleading information which are flooding the internet. There are debates on whether global warming is for real or not. So in this kind of a situation, how do we make our youngsters aware of the evils of climate change and that it is real and it's going to affect our future generations? I think the the jury is has has come back home. They're not still out on the question of whether climate change is real or not. Ninety-nine point two percent of the world's scientists have identified it as being real. All of the world's countries have identified it as being real and as being an issue that requires the most significant international treaty, the Paris Agreement, with the most intensive global obligations of any treaty that has ever been held. Only one country is opting out at this moment of the Paris Agreement, and that is the United States, driven by, in my view, a man who should never have been elected to be the president of, of that country. And, and if I hope that after the election in November, the United States will be in a position to come back. Vice President Biden has said that it's the first thing that they will do. And then we have this, this global regulatory 
the Paris Agreement is, is the global agenda for going forward. And I would say to the young people, and I would say to the teachers, and not all my friends in the travel and tourism sector agree with me on this, oh, Greta Thunberg, listen to the activists, because the activists understand this better than so many other people. And they, the only issue that they're concerned with is to have a safe, clean, green world in the future. And the internet is, is, is flooded with material from as activists. And read, read Naomi Klein, read um, 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 Michael Mann, Many, many, and, and on our, on our, and even people who don't take the course, if they come to our website, we have very, very good background information, and then reach your own conclusion, because you have to do that. And some people will say, I'm sorry, I still think it's a hoax. This is life. We don't all think the same way. Right, sir. Uh, so we will take uh, two more questions because we uh, don't have much time left. So, uh, so what could be a few tangible guidelines that tourists can follow to make tourism more climate friendlier? Start to keep a carbon count yourself. That's what the consumer app will do that we, we have issued with a company called Wise Kia a NASDAQ listed security company based in Geneva. Uh, download the app. It becomes available. Download your own carbon. Use travel suppliers who have filed a plan and listed it on the registry. That way you know that you are encouraging people to do the right thing. And it's amazing what what people are doing in in ben and jerry's ice cream shop in london if you go and you order an ice cream at the end when you get your bill they have measured the carbon accounting of all suppliers that all of ice cream and at the bottom of the bill you get a report that says this is this is the carbon count of three balls of ice cream I always have three balls because I like ice cream. And, and, and this is a carbon account. And we have paid two, two, two pounds or two, whatever they, they say, 20p, in order to offset the impact of this carbon. And if you want to make a contribution, please make a contribution. And I think this will become the norm just in packaging where you see fair trade packaging, you'll see fair climate packaging. And, and read and think and decide how you want to live your life. You know, I'm not a philosopher. I, I just think people have to look. Somebody said that if you see an elephant coming down the street, it's pretty hard to describe that it's an elephant. And I think that's the issue with climate now there's been it's here so so uh, we will take the last question of the day so while we acknowledge that elephant in the room or on the street as you were talking about there is one question which asks that how can carbon intense modes of travel like that of cruise holidays reinvent themselves to be more climate friendlier is it at all possible or not well <laughs> I think, and I'm going to sound very harsh, if they don't, they shouldn't be allowed to be in business at some stage. Every, I mean, we, we are such a diverse industry to answer the question by saying, do this or do that would, would, be, um, it would be silly because different companies in different countries have different ways business, large organizations, uh, the Oberoi Hotels, uh, the Tata Group, they will have mechanisms for making the change. 
smaller people have to look at their own ecosystem and and see what is best practice from other places. A company in India may not know what to do to make itself more carbon responsive. And yet a similar company in Peru may have already found out how to do this. We are trying to collect on our database examples of good practice. And I think people, the internet is incredible for this, for this. But if you ask Google, you get an answer. It may not be the right one, but you ask a different question and eventually you will get have a positive attitude. We had an event in New York for Morris Strong of the, of the General Assembly of the UN last year. And we had really a, a hundred sort of senior people from the climate and the travel and tourism sector together. And President Calderon, the former president of Mexico, was one of our guest speakers. And he said, you have to have hope. But in being negative about this, we can solve the problem, but we have to be clever, we have to be wise, and then we have to make the changes in a methodical way. And that's what we're trying to do with our four step solution and the concept of climate friendly travel. And I believe, just the last point, the most, the biggest elephant in the room at this moment is aviation, because it's a very significant part of the travel and tourism mix, and they don't see an alternative fuel. I'm told planes will not be flying with fossil fuels, because the cost of not being able to have travel and tourism is so dramatic that there'll be a huge focus on trying to find a cleaner way of propulsion. And I think this applies not just on the grand scale, but on the small scale as well. You find shower heads, which are more efficient. You find, you find, uh, you'll be printing machinery on, on, on 3D printers in small rural communities in India in, in five years time, in places where five years ago, you probably didn't even have connection to the internet optimistic, believe that the future. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, may I now request Professor Siddharthananda to please deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Bye. That was really, really, you know, cause of concern. In fact, uh, even I feel that it has already started. Strikes. It's a hint that the future is going to be very, very dangerous. We start don't start working on the climate change. Don't start working pollution factors, and it will affect tourism a lot. Again, thank you, sir, on behalf of Amity School of Tourism and Amity University, Kolkata. Thank you very much for sharing your most valuable inputs and time with us. For having us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Anytime. Thank you. Stay in touch.